Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. Today's topic is the taxation of foreign trusts and the American grantor, lifetime transfers and deemed sales. Today's presenters are attorneys Gary Forrester and Brian Page. Um, there is a copy of the presentation in the handout section, and you'll also find a, a brochure from the firm. Um, so feel free to download those if you want to follow along uh, with uh, the, the presentation. So let me turn it over now to our speakers, uh, Gary and Brian. Hello. Thanks for attending. Um, today we're going to talk about a very unique set of circumstances um, associated with the foreign trust, and that's the American grantor. Uh, foreign people who come into the country have opportunities, uh, tax planning opportunities and protective opportunities uh, regarding the use of the foreign trust. But the American, the U.S. resident and citizen also has very interesting uh, opportunities and treatment tax-wise of the foreign trust. Um, and we're going to work through those today over the next uh, hour. We'll probably do 50 minutes and then a 10-minute um, question and answer. Um, we've pulled up the agenda and we'll basically introduce you to the idea of the foreign trust um, in the introduction. The tax considerations are pretty wild. We're not going to be able to um, inform you of every aspect of how foreign trusts are taxed and how the American grant tour is impacted. But the takeaway from, from a seminar like this is to understand some of the general um, issues that you'll encounter when, for instance, if you're a CPA, you have a client who's a U.S. citizen or resident uh, who's considering using a foreign trust. You know, what, what, what should you really look out for? Is it, a, is it appropriate? Are kids involved? What kind of trust is it? Where is it formed? Um, and then we go into some uh, of the technical pieces on how uh, foreign trusts are defined. In other words, when is a trust considered a foreign trust by the IRS? When's it considered a domestic trust? And then when in the next number there for Roman numeral four, um, what kind of tax status <clears throat> does the IRS um, attribute to a foreign trust versus a domestic trust? Um, and then because the foreign trust kind of triggers certain uh, odd tax uh, outcomes, we go a little bit into the expatriation tax. Um, the expatriation tax is a tax that, that, that does just that. When someone leaves the country and gives up their citizenship, there's a, there's a tax. Um, it's called the exit tax by some, by some groups. Um, it's a deemed sale of whatever your assets are. A tax similar to that is imposed on people who fund a foreign trust under certain circumstances. And then we will walk through um, some of the forms you have to file, the compliance forms with the IRS and related uh, forms, and the basics on asset protection and foreign trust, which is a different seminar, but oftentimes we get a lot of questions on, okay, now we understand some of the tax. Um, can you give us some background as to why people form these foreign trusts for protective purposes? Um, we also go into related to the protective, some of the stuff we'll hit on LLCs. Um, we'll hit on some of the jurisdictions that make foreign trusts available. And the, and, and how the foreign trust has triggered in 16 U, uh, U.S. states, a similar trust. It's a domestic trust, but it's, it's kind of has, the, it has the flavor of a foreign trust. It's called a domestic asset protection trust. And then we'll close out with some keys to how the planning is effective, um, some misconceptions, and then conclusion. Okay. Well, I think the most important thing to understand um, from this webinar is to understand that if you utilize a foreign trust in planning or you have a, a, a client that either is a settlor, a trustee, or a beneficiary of a foreign trust, that there are substantial U.S. tax reporting requirements and, and compliance that has to be fulfilled every year as an ongoing obligation. And it's totally different than a uh, one that's formed in the United States, which is a, a domestic trust. 
Also, when a foreign trust is at the stages of the foreign trust, upon creation, upon income, and upon distributions, there are certain income tax consequences that might arise when the transaction occurs. You need to be aware of those and, and catch those so you can advise your clients perhaps to plan forward how it works and what the results are. Because again, practically speaking, when they when they want to utilize one of these vehicles, they're going to ask, you know, how does it affect me tax wise? And we'll be able to go through and, sh and, and explain in certain ways that you have an income tax issue and potentially a, a U.S. transfer tax, that, depending on the nature of the trust. And this is the one one place that I found in the code to where they don't always match up and the outcomes are different. And so we'll be able to go over those. And then lastly, you know, the status of the individual who creates the trust, where the beneficiaries are and where the, the, the trustee are affect the consequences of how the U.S. income tax applies to the trust. And so we'll also go over that. At a basic level, we all know that all U.S. people, persons, are subject to their worldwide income tax on all their assets. Yeah, oftentimes, oftentimes um, clients will come in um, and be under the impression that if they do business or invest in another country, that that country's tax structure would govern whatever income they make or the estate asset if they were to die, if it's foreign. Um, but the U.S. is not what's known as a territorial income tax jurisdiction. So we're a worldwide tax jurisdiction. Wherever you make the money, it's taxed by the U.S. There's ways to ameliorate that. We'll walk through some of that in terms of tax treaties and tax credits if you pay tax in two countries. But you're going to have to pay tax to the U.S. in general. Um, the, the, as Brian was saying, the, the separate issue is the estate tax. So when we talk about these foreign trusts, one of the one of the oddities of the foreign trust um, and separately expatriation, if if foreign trust is involved or not involved, is that you've got odd income tax triggers that can occur when assets leave the country and then when people leave the country, right? Um, totally separate from the tax associated with what you have when you die. The income and estate tax um, are treated totally separately, but because of the nature of the, the way the foreign trust works with assets moving offshore uh, and expatriation similarly works, you have to kind of coordinate the estate and the income tax because it's the income tax that total what radically changes when you deal with these structures where and the estate tax just kind of stays there as a continuing liability i mean we'll see as we go through here that even though you might have a completed gift for you know transfer tax purposes and you think it's out and it's okay when we say we say transfer tax is a state yeah, and gift tax a state and gift tax you think that oh you know i I've, I've already i've made the transfer i've applied my credit i'm good but that that ignores the income tax, the subtitle A consequence of a foreign trust and, and a transfer to a foreign entity. So we will go through that here. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you have a non-resident, uh, the the income tax it, obviously is going to be different. It would be it's going to be source based. Now there are some exceptions to that, and and they're listed here. But the main thing here to take away is is that non-resident aliens are treated differently than U.S. residents. Than U.S. residents and citizens. And if you're a citizen and you're not a resident, you're still subject to worldwide income by the United States. So if, if for instance, um, someone from France has a child born in the United States, it's not a voluntary uh, citizenship. That child is a U.S. citizen and subject to international taxation by the U.S. It's something that's you know very commonly missed and or ignored completely, um, and then what we have on the slide shows some exceptions to this worldwide income tax. Um, 
well, no, it's actually it's it's exceptions to the general rule that if you are not a U.S. resident and not a U.S. citizen, um, even if you have assets in the U.S., it still might not be taxed. So a non-resident, non-citizen can sell stock like IBM at a gain. And generally speaking, there is no tax. That's been true for a long, long time. Very few people understand that. Now, there are there are foreign people who would invest here um, because of that reason. In other words, they're in a they may be in a jurisdiction that says, you know, our government is going to tax you only on transactions and operations that occur in our country. It's very common. It's called territorial jurisdiction on tax. And so if you go ahead and buy and sell IBM stock in, in at a U.S. locale, we're not really going to be bothered with it. We're not going to be bothered with it. You can do whatever you want in that case. We're not going to tax you on it at all, which raises an interesting opportunity for certain non-resident, non-citizens because they're not taxed in their country, and the U.S. does not tax the sale of uh, basically U.S. corporation stock. Um, so they they buy and sell stock in the U.S. at no gain. We have we set those up all the time. Um, on the on the um, we're gonna oh we'll cover the transfer tax on the next slide, but that's also got some interesting exceptions. Um, we also have treaties where someone could. Um, buy and sell real estate or, or stock um, and the treaty would say it's well if you're a, a, a domicile and a citizen of I used France before I keep using France because they have a treaty actually um, then the law of France will govern we will not tax you on that in the US if you're domiciled in the US the, the laws of the US will govern uh, with respect to that asset. There's some interesting things that happen with treaties because sometimes what what France considers a U.S. source um, asset, the U.S. doesn't consider that a U.S. source asset. So oftentimes we have issues, for instance, with the U.S. considering U.S. stock um, U.S. if it's a U.S. company, no matter where the stock certificates are whereas another country says no no no, it's not a u.s it's not u.s stock because the certificates are held here i'll, I'll say france i don't know if france can, uh, follows the certificate rule um and now we have a conflict so the treaty may or may not apply so it's pretty interesting what you what you run into when people are doing cross-border transactions we note here the withholding rate on passive income so the special rules that are imply with this type of income and right. graduated rates for effectively so, connected income so it's not like a stock sale where they're not taxed or foreigners not taxed on a stock sale if you get interest or you get rental it, there is a 30 percent flat tax funny enough i know that was a big issue years ago the flat tax. it is a flat tax on on, on that income um and then, of course, if they actually start a business here, the rates are graduated. Right. And then, I mean, and then with foreign trust, I mean, if, if it's a foreign trust under U.S. law, it's a foreign entity. So a lot of these rules it has to be, you know, source of income would apply if it's from the U.S. And if not, then it would not be taxable. And then if you're a U.S. Benny of a foreign trust, um, when the income becomes available to you individually, then the individual beneficiary is taxed on that income. If you're a U.S. person who yes. is a beneficiary of a foreign trust. Right. So the foreign trust is kind of treated like a foreigner. Okay. But if you have a U.S. Benny, then the income may, may be attributed to the beneficiary. And then under s subtitle B of the code, the transfer tax, in this case, the estate tax, uh, if you're a U.S. citizen or a resident, you are you you have a you know you're taxed on your estate your gross estates all the worldwide assets um, when you die or you make a gift of them um, and then if you're a non-resident it's going to be just stuff inside the United States a non-resident non-citizen yes interesting that ex the exception here is very underutilized in other words even if you're a non-citizen a non-resident you are subject to the gift tax. And there's no and there's no exemption amount 
Like we have a big exemption amount here um, before you're taxed at all. But you don't have to pay tax on the gift of intangible assets. So if you do have um, stock in the United States corporation um, and you transfer the stock, that's the transfer of an intangible. It's a gift of a U.S.-based asset. But there's no tax. There's no gift tax. It, we, a US, it's funny. The U.S. people get upset because U.S. people still have to pay their gift tax on those transactions. The tricky part is if you don't give it away as part of a plan and you die with it, it's taxed. It's subject to the estate tax. With, with a $60,000 credit. That's yeah, so it. There, and it's, you're not going to get out of it with a credit. So, so it's, it's, it's kind of it, a lot of this stuff really requires years of planning. Um, we're dealing with several plan uh, issues right now where some people planned, some people didn't plan, and um, the the outcomes are outrageously uh, different. At a basic level, to understand what the difference is between a domestic and foreign trust, the uh, IRS has given us definitions. Um, for a trust to be domestic, it has to meet two tests. And it's an and test, so it's both. It has to meet the court test and the control test. And so if a U.S. court has the authority to bind the trust in the United States, then it would meet that criteria. And the control test is where's the trustee? Does a U.S. person manage the trust? If both of those tests are met, it's a domestic trust for income tax purposes. If it fails either of those tests or both, it's a foreign trust. Right. So what happens, Brian, if someone forms a, a trust in Florida, right, okay. but has but appoints a trustee in another country that doesn't come to this country and has no connection here? Then it would be a foreign trust. Isn't that true? It's tricky. It's tricky. We find inadvertent foreign trusts formed and then you slip into this wild net of taxation um, because you appoint a foreign trustee. You've got to be really careful with that. And the other issue is if, if, you, if you meet both tests and you have a U.S. trustee and then a person dies or resigns, uh -huh. and then you have a foreign individual takes their place or a company perhaps You've offshore. You just transferred all your assets to a foreign trust and didn't even know it. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, well, we're laughing, but it's crazy, the outcomes. It's pretty yes. crazy. People are shocked when they yeah. find that out sometimes. Okay. Practically, what does this mean if you have a foreign trust with a U.S. grantor? Well, we have um, a regime which imposes a mark-to-market deemed sale when a U.S. grantor transfers assets to a foreign trust now so that means that regardless of Is what happens in the estate tax right. a, a state or gift from an income tax perspective that's what happens now there's an exception to this if there's a u.s beneficiary of that foreign trust with the u.s grantor it will be deemed a grantor trust practically that means that the deemed sale will not occur until a later date and the later date is either the death of the U.S. grantor or the trust no longer has a U.S. beneficiary, either or. At that point, there would be a, a Section 684 deemed mark-to-market sale of all the assets inside the trust at that time, including appreciation. Yes. Yeah, so what's happened here is we had mentioned that expatriation, It's it, the government is trying to tax the transfer of assets abroad. Um, interestingly, if the grantor makes a gift of these assets to the foreign trust, a real gift, an irrevocable gift, and pays gift tax, it's not really related to this tax. This is an income tax. And Congress has made clear in their the way they formed the law that one tax is not, not directly impactful on the other and actually in many ways as we'll get into if a, if a gift is made mo removing gift tax would be payable and then the assets would be removed from the estate of the grantor oftentimes that can create a, a very negative outcome 
upon the death of the grantor. Um, so we have to be very careful. So if a gift is made, it's unrelated to this mark to market deemed sale. Um, but the, the takeaway on a lot of this grantor stuff for this seminar about the American grantor is it's very uncommon that an American grantor would not have a, a U.S. Correct. beneficiary. So if there's a U.S. beneficiary, um, the, 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 the rule, the, the deemed sale rule under 684 um, is not triggered because the U.S. beneficiary triggers grantor status, which means the grantor still owns everything in the eyes of the IRS for income tax purposes. And so 684 says if you're a grantor, if it's grantor status, then um, we're not going to yet impose the deemed sale. And that's kind of the takeaway on the um, 679, 684 deal. We'll go, I think we have a few more slides. Yeah, there's some more explanation, but it's important to, to, to understand and to make sure you ask the, the question, if you do have a U.S. grantor of a foreign trust, and they die, you must make a determination, are those assets pulled back into the settler's estate or not? Because that's really going to be the trigger if 684, uh, the dean sale applies, or if the assets are pulled back in and exposed to the estate tax, then that's 684 right. would yeah. not apply. Well, right. Assets. So so nothing would happen when, when the grantor is alive, if, if there's a U.S. beneficiary, and then when the grantor dies, what happens is if if the assets in the trust are not part of the grantor's taxable estate, then those assets do not get a step up in basis. It's because they've already been distributed pursuant to the gift tax. And what the step up in basis does is it eliminates the issue of deemed sale. So you no longer have a gain on the mark to market 684 deemed sale. So, but if the assets are not in the, in the grantor's taxable estate, there is no step up. And it's as if they're sold at the current fair market value. So not only has the grantor paid gift tax, now now you've got this, this terrible mark to market income tax. Right. right. And again, the way this is structured is based to mirror an expatriation. Yes. It's an expatriation of assets outside the United States. Yeah, right. That's right. And just and again, um, as we said before, the U.S. transferred taxes apply to the initial transfer, regardless of this income tax mm -hmm. classification and consequences. And to the death and and upon death. And upon death. Yeah. If it's a non-granted trust with no U.S. beneficiary, right then at that point it will be treated the mark to market would apply deem sale on creation and then anything after that any income would be as if it was a foreign trust that existed prior to that and so when income is distributed to a u.s beneficiary at that point they would recognize the income that beneficiaries would yeah it's it's as if it's if it's an actual foreign trust that, that you would that you would think of that the man and your client would think of. Okay, I'm going to create a foreign trust. It's like a foreign individual. I'm going to give assets in. They're out of my estate. Um, if 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 there's no U.S. beneficiary, then it's not pulled back in as grantor for income tax purposes. That's very uncommon though for the U.S. the American grantor because all you know they typically form these things for protective purposes. There may be estate purposes involved, um, but it's possible. It's possible that they, you know, sometimes you get somebody who's here for um, a period of years, uh, decides to stay. We have a number of these clients um, and their family's in, in another country. So they have, and, they, and they're, not a, they're not a beneficiary of the foreign trust. So you got no, no, benef no US beneficiary and it's not grantor otherwise under the grantor trust rules. Um, so you end up with a non-grantor trust um, and the uh, mark to market. Yes. 
the expatriation tax, as we explained before, is a regime to make sure that the U.S. government receives the unrealized appreciation of your worldwide assets when you leave. Yeah, it's 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 something. It, it's kind of an interesting history. When I first started practicing law, they were considering it. And Bill Clinton actually got it enacted in 1998. It was a very different tax. So what what had happened was, um, if you recall in one of the first slides, that if you're not a if you're not a citizen or resident, you can sell stock in a U.S. company at no tax. Okay. So that was an open rule. It, it, it was to encourage, I, I can only imagine, was to encourage investment in the U.S. So what had happened, uh, you know, from like maybe 1950 to 1995 was people would come in, foreigners would come in, um, sometimes on a visa, sometimes just to invest, and they would, they would cause a business to be started. Sometimes these businesses were related to a big foreign business or the or the individual really understood the business and knew that the, the market was huge in the U.S. and that it was going to be a success. And they would and they would develop huge value in these in these businesses. And what came to pass was there was no difference in the tax code with respect to a business you developed, you know, and IBM. So they would leave the country. All of a sudden, they're not a resident. They're they were never a citizen, and they would sell a stock, and there would be no tax. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> it, was, it was it was very common. I mean, it was obvious an obvious move. I mean, you you there was no tax, so they went ahead and sold the stock. So um, what happens is you get you get um, legislation that has to do with um, increasing or decreasing tax. Sometimes you know those in favor of a decrease in tax will have throwaway people i call throwaway pieces so this this tax is not very un well understood as you can imagine it's very complicated all this stuff and so um when when bill clinton got i can't remember what the what the main first it was a 10-year rule no but he but the actual legislation dealt with something like it was an omnibus budget act okay and then this got thrown in it was 93 yeah. and it was it was to it was to deal with these people selling the businesses and so what he said was you had to wait 10 years to sell the business to get tax-free treatment and um you know that and then people had to deal with it and it was pretty effective but unfortunately it triggered the idea and the political position of many legislators that why are we giving this to people at all. I mean, it, it was not revoked. You can still sell intangible stock um, um, at no at no tax, but you can't come in anymore. <laughs> you can't right. you can't come in and be here for eight or fifteen years, and U.S. citizens can't leave anymore and then sell assets. So what they did was they they created an exit tax. So if you're here as a citizen or you're here as a resident for a long period of time, eight to 15 years, and you leave, you're taxed. It's a very, it's a very un, under, it's a very lightly understood law, but it's real. It's very real. And it, and it's a deemed sale when you leave. Yeah, it's a deemed sale. There's no period of time anymore to deal with it. And and there are three factors. There are three tests if it a applies or not to the individual. So a U.S. citizen or a green card holder who resides eight out of 15 years, if you are, meet those two criteria, and then you have three tests here, the net worth test, which is if, you, if they're worth more than $2 million, the date of expatriation, it, it would apply if their income, and again, it, it's, it's indexed to an inflation each year so it slowly goes up but in the last five years they look back on how much yeah. money you made the income you can't plan that much for if you're looking right. back but the but the two million you know obviously you things that. are appraised and there's husband and wife sometimes the the, the expat the quote expat the, you know the foreign individual who is here for might have a, things in the wife's name there's all kinds of issues and there's credits you can use too yeah. if you're if you're a u.s resident or a citizen but 
Interesting enough, if you fail to file the tax compliance documents when you leave, it will also apply. Yeah, we've had a couple of uh, cases of that. So what happens is, is someone's here and they give up their green card is, is practically what happens. And you give the green card, um, but you don't, do, you don't expatriate with respect to the IRS. You don't file what they require you to file. They ignore the expatriation and you're still a worldwide, your resident here until you comply. So it's, it's not, it's actually kind of an odd, you know, it's not like it's a misfire. It's just no fire. You're just, you, if you're still taxed and, you, and if you haven't, if you haven't walked through the whole IRS process, it's as if you didn't leave. <laughs> Quite a surprise sometimes. Oh yeah. Just to give you a little bit of background, this, the current expatriation tax was passed in 2008. Um, and it's now found under 877 uppercase a, um, and, and, and the, the one, there are two different actual, depending on when you expatriated, there are two regimes. If it's prior to a, a date prior to 2008, the old 877 might apply. And if it's after it's 877 a, mm -hmm. and they're very different. They're very different. Yeah, you're not going to have much now because so many years have passed. We've been doing this because, you know, it, it, you're probably not going to be dealing with people who went before 08. We actually <laughs> sometimes <laughs> met someone. Well, who no, no. Sometimes you have people who they come in, they're here for, and then they go out and then they come in again, <laughs> you know, so like these, these in and out and, and it's not just for a year. I mean, these people kind of trip the, they trip the eight year rule and then it's, it's, it just becomes very complicated. Um, sometimes they get up out of your office and leave. So that sometimes they want an analysis. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. It's, it is a real rule. It is a real rule. Um, you will find about half the clients just run away, um, which is a mistake. The ones who obviously who who really really do the planning are the ones who have substantial assets here that you know they have a business here they can't just do that. If the deemed sale occurs, at least as it relates to the U.S. income tax rules, if you pay the deemed sale at the time, you will get a basis step up for the tax paid as it relates to the at least for the U.S. government. As for foreign governments. It's unclear because it's a deemed sale. It's not an actual sale. And each each country would have its own rules. Now, many, many countries don't even tax uh, sale assets like that, capital gains. An interesting um, net that this creates if this applies to the expatriate who leaves. If 877A applies, not only do you pay a market market when you leave, but later on, if you then give assets to a U.S. person, yeah, so the mark to market's an income tax, um, just similar to the that that applies to trust when you fund the trust, uh, or when you die if you, if it was a grantor trust. There's a, a a a mirrored estate tax for expatriates, which is fairly poorly done. It's very it's, very, it's very hard to follow this. They call it the inheritance tax, but basically. When someone expatriates and they pay their mark to market tax, I what we could surmise from this is that they don't the IRS does not want the individual to then start moving assets back into the US because sometimes the mark to market is actually low tax. Sometimes there's not a lot of gain on the tax. And so they created this inheritance tax where you can't start gifting back assets into people who are in the U S um, I basically it's a tax that's imposed on the U S recipient. I think it's a 40%. Yeah. It's a 40% similar to the highest rate of the state and gift tax um, on the U S recipient. I will tell you that 
have you seen this come? I, I do not see a lot of compliance with this. Yeah, I don't know how much role. this comes up practically. It's just something that really should be you'd be should be made aware of if someone leaves a country. When we say someone leaves a country, you know, we do have a few people, U.S. people who have expatriated. OK, that does happen. But it's this unintentional exit by someone who's a foreigner who's here for eight years that triggers the expatriation tax. That's where you're really going to see it if you do any foreign work. Um, pretty common, actually. And then if they oftentimes the kids stay here. So if they expatriate out, they pay their expatriation mark to market tax. Be careful with the repatriation of the assets because the recipient U.S. resident or citizen kid is going to get hit with tax. And this is the only transfer tax that exists in the code to where the donee pays the tax. You know, also unique about it is kind of, it doesn't really expire. It's forever tainted. Yeah, it's, and it's not, it's not like what you took out of the U.S. It's, it doesn't expire and it, 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 it applies to any asset that the expatriate or foreigner leaving acquires and gives back to the kid who's still in the U.S. It's a very odd tax. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty, it's got a pretty wide scope. And the, as a part of this, the determination for domicile for the U.S. estate and gift tax is different than income tax. It's based on presence and intent to remain in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it's possible for an individual to be a resident for for the estate tax, but not for the income tax. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. That's or, a great or point. vice you, versa. You could expatriate and subject yourself to the mark to market tax and still be a U.S. tax domiciliary for estate tax purposes. Which is a complete mess, but yeah, you could it's leave, possible. you could leave, let's say you could leave based on the days you're here, right? right. Lose your U.S. income tax residency. Give up your green card. Let's say you give up your green card. That's that's poor. That's kind of a bright line. But you intend to stay. You intend to retire here later. You're a U.S. You're a U.S. domiciliary for estate tax purposes. I mean, this stuff. It's almost like you couldn't make it up. It, there, there's so many twists and turns. It really is so factually related. Um, we we come across this all the time. We had something happen yesterday where someone made a terrible mistake. <laughs> because they didn't want to talk to us for five minutes and we'll have to work that out it's it's if you have this stuff come up we actually cater to um cpas and uh financial professionals so when the stuff comes up we love when you call we it's we we obviously want you to call us and work through things we, we there's no billing associated with our referral sources um we and we give these seminars as kind of just red flags you know, when the stuff comes up, just just call us. We walk through it. Stuff that you're really waiting for, the compliance and the forms that you need to be aware of if you're filing returns. Uh, there are a few here that I'll just I'll go over briefly. The main one is the form 3520. This form, if you have a U.S. citizen or resident who creates a foreign trust or is deemed to create one, they have to file this form annually, and it's required. And it, it goes along with their 10. 40 they file each year, and, and that includes extensions. Interesting enough, this return will require a statement from the next form. I'm going to talk about the 3520A. This form is, is required to be filed by the trustee mm -hmm. of a foreign trust each year. And they match it back. And they match it back. Mm -hmm. And it's due March 15th of each year, so the third month. So you have a time to give one out to the U.S. grantor and to the U.S. bennies. Mm -hmm. So they're able to match it. If the foreign trust fails to file this form, the U.S. owner is still responsible. So keep that in mind. If the trustee fails, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then any U.S. binny who is a beneficiary, even if there's no income, 
is required to file a statement saying that they are a beneficiary of a foreign trust. And it's the 35 to 20. It's a very long form. Parts of it won't apply to the U.S. Bene beneficiary or the U.S. owner, but it's the same form. It would be filed with the U.S. Benny's 10 to 40 as well. The other forms that are important are the form 8938, the FACTUS, reports and that that deals with assets that are overseas they reside in the u.s there there are monetary amounts where it applies they're listed there and then you have the f bars which if you have a foreign account offshore you're going to have to report that to the and again yeah, the these, F, these are just reporting requirements well, the f bar the f bar is where you get caught the the the, the fact uh um typically if you've got a foreign um, account with securities in it, whether you're a trust or an individual. It, both, it by the way, it applies to both. Um, the wirehouse or the brokerage is going to deal with the FATCA. The FinCEN, we find people get caught. They they worked in. We had a woman worked in. Um, I think it was in Norway for a period of time, and she had an account with twelve thousand dollars in it. Can you imagine she has an account. It's just it's just she's back in the states and she violated the uh, far bar form what happens on these small accounts is um you know once they get hit with the penalty the interest and the interest I mean they have to give up the account it's yeah it's ridiculous it's ridiculous it's very draconian that covers the tax aspects of the foreign trust and the US grantor now there are some basics here of asset protection that are just some highlights that are important. So what we talk about um, in terms of asset protection, we're really focused on trust in this seminar, but trusts are really only a small piece. And we wanted to make sure you had this in the seminar so you could print it out and have it for your notes. But we deal with titling, which is when people buy a property, they have sometimes the opportunity to title bank accounts, uh, securities accounts, um, real estate um, in a variety of ways. If people are married, for instance, and their husband and wife, we only have a few minutes, so I'm not going to go crazy with this. Um, but they, there's tenancy by the entirety available in Florida. Some states it's not available with tenancy by the entirety for married persons uh, ends up creating is a barrier to suit against one of the two spouses. So if one spouse is sued, the asset's not available to the plaintiff. That's like I said, that's not available in every state. So what we do in states where it's not available, especially with personal property, is we create one of the entities, which is the fourth dot there, fourth uh, bullet point. <clears throat> so we create an entity in a state that allows tenancy by the entirety, and then the entity would own the asset where tenancy by the entirety is not available. We typically use LLCs, um, which, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a different seminar, but LLCs are much more protective than corporations. Corporation stock could be taken by a plaintiff. LLCs are typically protected in that the plaintiff would only be entitled to a lien on the LLC equity. And if the LLCs held husband and wife, they, the plaintiff would have to have a claim against both husband and wife just to get the lien. There are exceptions to their weaknesses to the LLC for a single member and there are other very specific problems uh, which we handle in our LLC seminar. Um, the other, the, the, so, we, so we've dealt with titling, we've dealt with entities, trusts are, you know, some people consider them an entity, some people consider them, I've had these debates and I'd rather avoid the debates because they're not really significant. Some people consider them an arrangement we had that once. It's an arrangement um, where you where, where assets are put with someone uh, for someone else's benefit, and that allows uh, for the division of the title of the asset. So the trustee has legal title. The trustee decides when distributions are made, and oftentimes how invest how assets are invested. Whereas a beneficiary does not have the ability to reach the assets. So if the beneficiary is sued there's no ability of the creditor to reach the assets because the beneficiary has no right to the assets. That's how trusts work in general uh, versus like an LLC. Um, there's exemptions. Exemptions are exempt assets where you can just buy them in your own name. Um, and if you're not subject, 
at the time to any claims or litigation, the, the asset's exempt from, from future from future claims. So if you buy life insurance, for instance, um, in Florida, um, the the uh, the value, what's called the cash value, is generally exempt um, from the from the creditors um, of the insured. In some states, it's not the creditors of the insured, it's the creditors of the beneficiary. It depends on the state. Very commonly, very common error there where you're not, you're not tracking the statute. Some people feel that, you know, if I, if I go ahead and, and um, create a cross purchase agreement that the, my insurance, my insurance, the value of my insurance on somebody else is, is, is exempt from my creditors. It's, it's only the value with respect to the creditors of the insured, not the owner. So there's some, there's some tricky aspects to it. Um, what else do we have before we close out today, Brian? What's the next title? We have some questions. Would you like okay. to take some questions now? Sure, sure. Okay, so we have our first question here from Joni. Um, can a U.S. resident gift up to 15000 to a Canadian resident, uh, a daughter in this case? Um, Daughter is a U.S. citizen. Is there a tax on that? So the the, the gift is the gift from a U.S. citizen or U.S. resident. Is that what the question was? Yes, a, a, a U.S. resident and a U.S. resident gift up to fifteen thousand to a Canadian yes. resident. Yes. And in this case, it's a daughter, and the daughter is also a U.S. citizen. Yes. Yeah, no problem. 15, not problem 15, at all. 000, no it's, problem. it's based it's based on the domicile of the person who's making the gift. Who was the donor, which would be the mother. Okay, great. Um, our next question here is from Charles. If one is planning reunification, would moving to Puerto Rico reduce the five-year average look-back qualification for covered expatriates? The five-year look-back rule for, repeat that again, please. If one is planning reunification, would moving to Puerto Rico reduce the five-year average look-back qualification for covered expatriates? Probably not. That's a very technical question, but Puerto Rico um, is is not considered expatriation because it's a U.S. Uh, territory. But we could we could we could um, take a call from Charles on on that technical issue separately. But that would probably take another seminar to work, <laughs> yeah, to work through that to the work through those territories pieces. yeah no but that, that probably not probably wouldn't be wouldn't would not um reset anything okay yes and he'll give you a call if he has more questions on that i think that's all the questions i have i may have been pronouncing that wrong i was saying reunification re, uh renunication <laughs> Oh, anyway, well, okay. Renunciation. 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 Okay, there we yeah, go. Yeah, moving just back. To clarify for the rest no, of no, it right. could make no. I see. No, it could make him a resident again, and and bring him back into the Puerto Rican tax regime, which is different from the U.S. tax regime. And then we go down that road for another hour. But it probably it probably doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with the renunciation if you have new if you have citizenship in a different country. Um. So. Um, if we don't have any more questions, we had we had some basics on LLCs, which you guys have in your materials. There's your charging order protection from LLCs, where to form it. Some some jurisdictions are more protective than others. An offshore LLC, very protective in Nevis, West Indies. Um, we're available um, at your convenience to call us on any of these issues. Um, Obviously, when we when we use offshore entities, we typically recommend that the assets are also offshore if you're doing it for protective purposes. Um, here's some of the um, characteristics of the Nevis LLC. Um, continued the form and location. These are these are protective trusts. Some of the characteristics of offshore trust and. As I had mentioned, um, this Gary, 16 states have, de has, have developed a similar self-settled, my own trust made for me, which they protect, but they're not, they're not um, generally as protected as the offshore trust with offshore assets because U.S. courts can reach them. Here are some of the, the uh, characteristics of the trust in my book. Um, when do, how do we, how do we select? 
trustees, as, as Brian had mentioned, we typically want to create an offshore of foreign trust. And if we use a, a U.S. Uh, beneficiary and we have too much when we have too much of a connection to the U.S., we might have not even be creating a foreign trust sometimes, you know, for tax purposes. True. Um, sometimes you do that on purpose, actually. You can have a protective trust that's actually a U.S. trust. It looks like a foreign trust, but it's U.S. for tax purposes. And you have some of the different types of trusts here. Um, and there's your domestic asset protection trust. Here's some cases. We have people who create U.S. asset protection tr trusts, but they end up hiring a trustee in the wrong state or their their connection to it's too close and they and they and and especially if you file bankruptcy there's some likelihood that that u.s asset protection trust will not function to protect anything that was um what was the name of that case Hu huber and then mortenson you got to be real careful with bankruptcy because he he did a good job with a with a alaska trust but then filed file bankruptcy, which created a 10-year statute of limitation. He was brought back into the pulled it back in into yeah. the uh, divorce. His wife ended up with the whole trust because he had transferred assets there within the 10-year period. These are some technical cases, and then here's the trust go case. Sometimes it works. The sometimes when we form these trusts. We tell we tell the creditor, okay, we're about to, we're going to do this. There's nothing going on, but now they're aware. So the statute of limitations runs by the time they, in this case, they later they had a problem with the bank, but the statute of limitations had run. This is Kilker crazy. This is California. Sometimes they do what they want. It just doesn't help. And that's why we use foreign trusts. And here are some of the factors in the effectiveness, especially of U.S. asset protection trust. Where is everything? Do you control it? You know, are you taking advantage of the system? Um, anonymity, you, you, you definitely want to go offshore, and that's that. Thanks so much for attending. We really appreciate it. We love giving these webinars, and please call us. Our information is there on that last slide.